Before coming here, you may have wondered, why would a museum dedicated to the preservation and promotion of the legacy of Robert Louis Stevenson present a lecture that will discuss the seemingly unrelated author Gertrude Stein? But that is part of the beautiful gift that's uh, provided by this museum. The opportunity to explore and understand the times in which Stevenson lived in addition to his life and literary achievements. While Robert Louis Stevenson and his wife Fanny likely never met Gertrude Stein, there is a bond of time and place between them that has inspired this talk. In both Fanny Stevenson and Gertrude Stein, I see shades of similarities that I'm sure neither would have ever imagined existed. Both are known as strong, independent women with a love of fine and literary arts. Both spent time living locally in Oakland and also in Paris, France. And yet their lives truly are incomparable for the most part. For the most part. What I would like to explore with you this evening are the experiences of these women as East Oakland residents vacationing in the Napa Valley in the 1880s. For while there are more differences in their lives at the time of their visits than can readily be mentioned, the descriptions that they have left with us of their time here in Napa combine to provide what it, I think is a unique vision of life here over 130 years ago. To begin this venture into times past, let us look where Gertrude and Fanny began in Oakland. By the way, I'd like to say thank you to our person who is providing the motion on our slideshow, my wonderful mother, Nancy Schleicher. <laughs> yes. Um, so here's a map of the greater Oakland and Alameda vicinity uh, back in 1876, just before uh, our story takes place. But let's zoom in a little closer. This is kind of a fast progression. And here you can see the heart of Oakland with Lake Merritt at center. Now we're going to zoom in to the seventh ward here. And let's look first at East 12th Street between 4th and 5th Avenues. There we go. Where the landmark Tubbs Hotel was built in 1870. A turreted five-story hotel described as surrounded by gardens of geraniums, fuchsias, and roses, the Tubbs Hotel is where newly divorced Fanny, Ste or Fanny Osborne, filled with worry that her beloved from Scotland might die before their marriage, brought Robert Louis Stevenson towards the end of March 1880. The hotel is also where Daniel Stein, fresh from Europe and uh, via Baltimore, uh, brought his wife and five children to stay for a year in early 1880 before finding a suitable house to rent in January of 1881. Now, no one knows for sure, but it's likely that Robert Louis Stevenson and the Steins were actually staying in the hotel at the same time, but Stevenson was so ill they probably never met. Uh, for Stevenson spent only a few weeks into April here before Fanny disregarded societal norms and took him to her own home to nurse him back to health. Now imagine this newly divorcee, she has two children, and she's bringing a man who is not her husband to stay with her at her house. But you have to remember, Stevenson was said to have suffered his first lung hemorrhage at the Tubbs Hotel in Oakland. And as you can imagine by this map, the distance between her cottage and the hotel must have seemed insufferable as she trekked back and forth. Um, here is a view of Fanny's beloved cottage during her time there. Uh, she was known to be an avid gardener, as is evidenced in the lower lush photograph, and another view kept in a family scrapbook that we have here in the collection. Um, it is likely far more humble a dwelling than the house the Stein family rented for $50 a month, known as the Old Stratton Place. Although there appear to be no photographs surviving of it, the house was described as a frame house, standing on a hilltop with views of Lake Merritt surrounded by a 10-acre yard 
bordered by a rail fence and a long drive lined with shaggy eucalyptus trees. However, here are some views of the neighborhood. This is on a hilltop looking towards Lake Merritt from the area of the Steins house. And the one above it is also said to be in the neighborhood with children playing in a water bowl. Um, in later years, Gertrude would recall how she and her siblings reveled in the space, the view, the apple and cherry orchards, and the pets, dogs, and birds, a goat. <laughs> Millie Stein, Gertrude's mother, also brought to the home chickens and a cow, planted a hedge of roses, and raised a garden of vegetables and fruit for preserves. It is from this home which Gertrude Stein would later idealize that the Stein family would find occasion to escape, particularly after Millie Stein, uh, her illness began in 1884. Years later, in Gertrude's 1937 book, Everybody's Autobiography, she would reflect on these memories of vacation in California. She wrote mostly of her time with her beloved brother Leo, and in glimmering brevity is suited to distant memories. But this leaves us with little detail to imagine Gertrude's California of the 1880s. Instead, we have passages such as this. My brother was two years older and a man, and we were always together. When we were very little children, we went miles and miles on dusty roads in California together, all alone together. And we would shoot a jackrabbit, and then I would try to shoot after he had. And it was in the days when Californ in California you could go miles and miles and miles and be alone together. As for Napa Valley, Gertrude also wrote in similar brevity in the same book about her 1934 recollections of her time here. St. Helena is where we used to take the stagecoach to go up into the mountains, into the Etna Springs, where we used to swim in mineral water and go down into the quicksilver mines and where the Chinamen were working, and where the overseer could swear 15 minutes without repeating himself. <laughs> and, and where uh, we knew the Madrone and the Manzanita, and where my brother and I had walked, at least we had intended to walk. But everybody gave us a lift from St. Helena to Etna. It was where a great deal that I could remember did happen. As eloquent and characteristically Stein and style and form as these passages are about Napa, it made me wonder more about what it would have been like for the Stein family to come and vacation here at Etna Springs, just a few short years after Robert Louis Stevenson documented his and Fanny's honeymoon in the valley in the book, The Silverado Squatters. But what Stein has provided us is from the height of her avant-garde, a time in which she is trying to engage us, her reader, and her own conscious awareness without the burdens of details, which might isolate us from her thoughts. So while looking for possible details of the Steins in Napa, I was led to go back in time, before Stein's experiments with language and long before her fame, when she was still a young student at the Harvard Annex, later called Radcliffe College. It turns out that only a few years after her trip to Napa, she used the details of this, one of her favorite California memories, for a different kind of story than we would expect from her. A story of one of the vacations the Steins took to Etna Springs Resort via St. Helena, a story, or rather an adventure, in which she titled The Birth of a Legend. Oops, here's, do it once more. Yeah, it's okay. Thank you, then. Mm -hmm. So, the picture in the upper left is of uh, Gertrude when she first came out to California, and these are her later when she was attending the university. Who's the dapper guy? Yeah. Oh, that's Leo, her brother. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I forgot to mention. I like that oh. right Isn't that great? <laughs> <laughs> but before I read to you the short paper that uh, is known to a few outside of the scholarly Stein circles, I would like to remind you all of what another woman found in Napa Valley a few years before Gertrude's adventures here. If we return our thoughts to the Osborne Cottage in East Oakland in April of 1880, 
we find a woman, 34 years, Gertrude Stein Sr., caring for the man she loved. Once his health stabilized, Fanny Osborne was married to Robert Louis Stevenson on May 19th in San Francisco. Uh, here are some more items from our wonderful collection, including the original marriage certificate. The only witness at the ceremony was Fanny's good friend, Dora Norton Williams, seen here. Dora was the wife of the famed artist Virgil Williams, who incidentally led the founding of what has since become the San Francisco Art Institute. The Williams owned a cottage up here in Knights Valley on Sugarloaf Mountain, which they often offered to friends for vacations. Here is one of Virgil's paintings of their ranch. Though unknown why the Stevensons did not stay here then, these other paintings by Williams of the area certainly could have helped enchant them if they had seen them. Uh, this is a shack in Knights Valley. This is actually in the Sharpstein Museum's collection. A view of Mount St. Helena. And this fantastic panorama is from Mount St. Helena looking towards Knights Valley. And on the horse in the foreground is actually Dora, Virgil's wife. Um, here we go. On May 22nd, the couple arrived in Vallejo after a train and two ferry rides, and then the next day traveled north to Calistoga by train. At what has been suggested to be the recommendation of Fanny's ex-husband, which was quite gentlemanly of him, <laughs> the couple stayed their first week in a cottage at the Hot Springs Hotel, known commonly to us today as Sam Brandon's Cottages. And one more. Good. As we can see here. Uh, it is during this time that Robert Louis Stevenson likely had his first telephone call with uh, Colonel Foss of the stagecoach fame here at a Chesbro's Magnolia Hotel. It is also when the Stevensons visited the Petrified Forest, tasted the wines of Mr. Macron, the Schramms, seen here, and at the Baron, with the Beringer brothers, and visited St. Helena all by horse and track, of course. I should note that this visit to Beringer's would have been before the Rhine House was built, as depicted in this illustration. Um, just in case you're wondering why it's not there. <laughs> then, at the encouragement of a local shop owner named Kelmar, they discovered the bunkhouse at the old Silverado mine, and after some preparations, stayed there until the end of July. Although the story may be familiar to many of you, having read the Silverado Squatters and living here, what you should remember is that this book is a well-crafted travelogue by a master of the English language, who wrote and reworked the adventure based on his diary that he kept here at the time. Of course, much of the book does match his diary verbatim, as the writings were less of a personal diary and more of an intended manuscript journal from which he could later produce the finished book. But it is in this original Silverado journal that we can catch a better glimpse of what the adventure in Napa was like with some interesting details about Fanny Stevenson left out of the book. One passage which found itself only minimally included in the final book is dated May 26th and is about a failed attempt to visit the Shrams. They were not at home being in St. Helena. Huh? Mr. Johnson, his young wife, and Fanny and I set forth in a trap to visit the wine cellars of Mr. Shram. You go down a valley a little way among green meadows and white oaks standing handsomely apart and past comfortable houses with verandas and bald-looking, incomplete houses without verandas, standing in the damp thickets. At one point, the road lies along the bed of a stream lined on either hand with sweet-smelling willows. At another, it passes a great and rich establishment with an enormous overshot water wheel, as tall as the trees that grow beside it and fed by a little airy water trough coming wandering toward it through the wood upon preposterous stilts. The hills are around us, all the way and Mount St. Helena at our backs. A great aerial bulk of mountain 
buttresses on all sides by cliffy ridges. The chief character of the landscape, I note, is from the sparse, tall trees along the mountain edge. However, far as you may be, each fir stands separate against the sky, no bigger than an eyelash, and altogether lends a quaint, fringed aspect to the hill. At length, we turn sharply up the mountain dell, a trail honeycombed through the woods. A stream on its last legs trickles close by, thimbleberries, a sort of mock hawthorn, buckeyes just beginning to flower in the great double twisted horns. Fanny had forgotten to put oil on her face and was promptly poisoned with poison oak, the curse of this country, no offense to rattlesnakes or hairy tarantulas. <laughs> However, poison oak was not the only illness to plague Fanny on the trip, I'm afraid. Soon after their move to Silverado with her son Sammy, later known by his middle name Lloyd, um, both Fanny and her son fell seriously ill with diphtheria. Stevenson, a sickly man himself, suddenly found it necessary to carry them both down the mountainside to recuperate in Calistoga for a few days. And yet, there were many pleasant times for Fanny, who, like her husband, enjoyed the people they met in the valley. Fanny, a capable and likable woman, not only spent time chatting with Mrs. Schramm on the veranda, as mentioned in the final book, but she took time to console the poor woman on her husband's requirement of wearing a corset, even in the hot sun, <laughs> when, whenever she goes to pay a visit. Hence, she pays no visit. And hence, as she says, people hate her. <laughs> Fanny was also a cheery companion to Kelmar and his Jew girls, a term both Stevensons used in writing to indicate Kelmar's wife and friend, Abramina. Stevenson noted in his journal that at Mrs. Giles, we drank a bottle of wine and had an age-long conversation, after which he continued that Abramina, Abrahamina and Fanny were now as thick as thieves. It is not to be wondered at, for there was something really beautiful in this old girl's gamesome, natural Jew soul. And as the others were somewhat inclined to cut her garrulity short, she could not fail to appreciate so dutiful a listener as my wife. Yet to understand Fanny's view of her time here in Napa, we really need go no further than a letter she wrote to her mother-in-law when the Silverado Squatters was first published in 1883. After writing of her protest that the publishers did not get the corrected proofs in time, so that the entire story was rather garbled and spoiled in her mind, Fanny writes Mrs. Stevenson, you wonder at my allowing Lewis to go to such a place. Why, if only you knew how thankful I was to get there with them, I was told that nothing else would save his life, and I believe it was true. We could not afford to go to a mountain resort place, and there was no other chance. There were many worse things that Lewis does not tell, such as the fact that all the time both Sam and I were sickening for diphtheria. Then, on the next day, I put in doors and windows of light frames covered with white cotton with bits of leather from the old boots for hinges, made seats and beds, and got things to look quite homelike. It was at the end, when I was getting weak and nervous, that I smashed my thumbnail and had a violent nervous chill afterwards. Then, when we came up with the Jew boys, we stopped at a vineyard and had some good wine. So I went back to that place on the horse and got some red and some white for Lewis, and some dried peaches and fruit, which we kept cool in the tunnel and which we enjoyed extremely. Lewis says nothing about the flowers. But the beauty of them was beyond description, to say nothing of the perfume. At the back was a thicket of trees covered with cream-colored and scarlet lilies. I have never seen the like anywhere in the world. Every day, Lewis grew stronger and stronger. Of course, he could not tell how every morning he laid naked in the sun, browning one side and the other, finishing with a rub down of oil. I only wish he could do that now. In this reflection, we can see that even with the bouts of hardship, Fanny continued to think fondly of this unconventional honeymoon. And this, too, can be gently paralleled to Gertrude's reminiscences of California. 
After all, the Stein children were suffering the four-year illness of their mother during the time of the trip written about by Gertrude. This illness eventually led to Millie's death in 1888, which was followed by the death of Stein's father, Daniel, in 1891. It was only a few years later Gertrude would pen her essay at Radcliffe about California. Yet for her too, bouts of hardship did not bring her memories to waver when she thought of the Napa Valley. Now, I'd like to read to you Stein's essay, Birth of a Legend. Um, sorry. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to note that this is a transcription of her original essay by <coughs> Rosalind Miller, which includes some corrections and suggestions inserted by another hand, possibly Stein's professor. I've taken liberty to make use of some of these corrections when necessary for a grammatical <coughs> continuity, but for the most part shall read it without these inclusions. Additionally, please note that Gertrude renamed her brother Harry in this story. Although she never had a brother by that name, it is clear by her statement of age difference that the brother is Leo Stein, who was pictured with the tennis rackets. Okay, the birth of a legend. When we were Californians, we used regularly to spend our summer in the mountains of Napa County. In order to reach the springs, we had to stage a distance of 20 miles from the town of St. Helena. One summer, my father suggested that my brother and myself walk instead of riding. Harry was just 13 and I about 11, and so we agreed to the proposition in high glee. We decided to perform our pilgrimage on a Sunday, a day that the stage did not run in order that all temptation to give up our project might be removed. The porter woke us early in the morning and we started out bravely. We carried a shotgun in a small satchel with refreshments. It was a delicious summer morning. The air, fragrant with pine, had that crispness and clearness that I think is peculiar to California. The long, cloudless summers removed every particle of moisture from the air. At night, the stars have an unearthly brilliancy. In other lands, the heavens appear as a surface. Here, every star hangs down out of the blue behind it, and you, for the first time, realize that each is a world apart. We soon covered the level ground and struck up the heavy mountain grade. As we were passing a pond in a canyon, we saw a bird that was new to us, resting on what seemed a little island near the bank. My brother raised his gun and fired. The bird fell over dead. We were heartless youngsters then, and were so fond of our shooting that we had no sympathy for our victims. Harry climbed down the bank to get his quarry. He stepped on the seeming island, which was really only a bit of reed and sticks. He lost his footing and went down well up to his waist. Before I could come to his rescue, he had scrambled out and stood on the shore, a most forlorn and dripping laddie. There was nothing for it but to let the sun dry him. If you have ever been in California, you probably were compelled to notice the remarkable dustiness of the roads. Even if you have not been there, please picture yourself. The thick dust, the result of fully three months of dry weather on Country Road, you can imagine what a picture poor Harry presented for the dust, eager to seize on the only bit of moisture that it had known for many a day came joyously down and gathered around his moist garments. However, we were born bohemians, and we trudged along, hopefully. The sun was now well up in the sky, and it was growing exceedingly warm. We picked some large, cool madrone leaves and grew very, uh, that grew very conveniently for the hot wayfarer. They come in groups of three and four in the shape of a fan and are a delightful protection. Okay. Protection from the glare of the sun when put just under the hat, shading the face. The scenery soon began to grow somewhat tedious. We have so little forest country, unless one goes to the Sierra Nevadas, that our walks are apt to be monotonous. Of trees except the madrone and the lordly redwood, one finds only the low shrub-like manzanita and the deadly poison oak. The oak is the one leaf that gives our country brilliant color. But alas, for those that are susceptible to its dread power, 
Even a breath of its air wafted from those brilliant red leaves means a week of suffering. The streams by the middle of summer are all dried up, and the dust has settled on all the foliage, and nature sadly needs a refreshing sprinkle. Our hunting zeal had not yet abated, although the heat was beginning to tell on us. As we marched along, we noticed a little jackrabbit sitting right across the road. His long ears were impudently pointing towards us, saying as plainly as ears could say, don't you wish you had me, little boy? Harry immediately accepted the challenge and began to load his gun in order to give little Johnny Rabbit a lesson. Unfortunately, the cartridge stuck and would not go in. It was too large for the gun. Then my brother tried to get it out, but this also was unsuccessful, for once halfway in, it was resolved to stay. All this time, the little rabbit was watching us with the most tantalizing expression in its intelligent ears. Harry tugged with his teeth, and I hardly dare breathe. I was so afraid the rabbit would go. Harry managed to cut the cartridge out with his knife, and just as he was about to put in a good one, Master Rabbit, with the defiant wish of his stub of a tail in the last impudent week, with those long ears, leaped into the wood. We plodded on. The hunting became more successful, and we added two heavy rabbits and a woodpecker to our baggage. To make progress easier, we hung all of our goods and chattel on the gun, each taking an end of it, and thus we managed to get along. We were now about five miles on the road. Before this, we had refused several offers of a lift from sympathetic farmers passing by, but now our weary little souls began to yearn for the repetition of offers that we had heretofore so indignantly refused. We had not got much further on the journey when we were overtaken by a jolly farmer who, of course, urged us to have a ride. We made a feeble protest as a sock to our pride and then only too happily yielded to his urgency. We scrambled in. How different the whole landscape became when we could see it changing before our eyes without being distracted by a fast increasing weariness. As we mounted higher and higher into the hills, we could see the whole broad <coughs> Napa Valley below us with the slight haze of the summer's heat hanging over it. The view was not particularly picturesque. There was a painful sameness and artificiality about those squares of vineyard dotted here and there with cool wine cellars. However, our farmer said the view was fine, so we acquiesced but soon turned our eyes with greater enjoyment to the hills above us with their madrone and redwood and their brilliant poison oak. Our farmer was very much amused at our project of walking to the springs. Every few miles he would ask us jocularly whether we did not want to get out and walk, but our ardor had been so thoroughly dusted that we were perfectly willing to let him joke while we rode rather than to be proud and walk. He finally deposited us within a mile of our destination, and we gave him a squirrel that we had shot in thanks. As he drove off down the road, his jolly laughter rang in our ears. We once more loaded our gun with our spoils and started. When we had walked about a quarter of a mile, those rabbits began to grow painfully heavy. We decided finally that rabbits were not much good anyway, they being so common, so we dropped one and then the other, by the roadside. We arrived at last, for foot sore and weary and covered with dust, a little after one o'clock. As soon as the people heard that we had started to walk without waiting for the rest, they dumped us the infant prodigies and hurried us into the supper. We never lost that reputation in spite of all disclaimers. Many years after, when we went back to the old place, we heard the legend told of a tiny boy and girl who had walked 20 miles up the mountain in half a day. Thus shall we figure in the future folklore of California. <laughs> this is the end of Gertrude's account of one of the Stein family's excursions to Etna Springs. <clears throat> Um, a vastly different scale of adventure compared with that of Fanny Stevenson, particularly since it is on such 
a shorter time frame. Yet I hope you too shared in the beauty conveyed by both travelers. And perhaps you too found yourself imagining the valley of over a century ago. And so here I'll end my own short adventure with Fanny Stevenson and Gertrude Stein, legends in their own right, yet also both women having left to us the legends of their trips spent here in Napa Valley as they remembered them in writing. I would like to hope that there are more details of both of their time spent here. However, I will leave that quest up to those of you who may be inspired to learn more about these adventurous visitors to our valley. Thank you.